We've certainly seen 12 months of very intensive Irish diplomacy uh, moving to each EU capital to raise awareness of the key implications of Brexit. Um, and I think we have seen where just recently the Irish Tiasek and Prime Minister May met after her speech in Florence, Italy to seek more specifics and additional progress on these issues. So we have this extraordinary opportunity. Minister Coveney uh, was appointed as Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, just in mid-June of this year, but he is a seasoned uh, veteran of ministry positions, having previously served as Minister for Housing, Planning and Local Government, uh, also serving as Minister for Defense and Minister for Agricultural, Agriculture, Marine and Food. Food. So covering the landscape as one of the youngest members of the Irish Parliament appointed in 1998, also served in the European Parliament uh, in 2004, serving on the Foreign Affairs Committee and held the pen for the European Parliament's annual report on human rights in the world. And we know that is an awesome report and task. Uh, so when he's not in the diplomatic scrum, I think uh, Mr. Coveney enjoys playing a bit of rugby for his beautiful County Cork, where he heralds from. So please join me in welcoming Minister Coveney for his remarks on Brexit, and then we'll follow up with a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather, and uh, uh, thank you to everybody for taking the time to be here. Um, I know this is a very informed audience, uh, and so. Um, well, I have a, uh, a long speech written, um, uh, I'd like to make some remarks and then maybe deal with, uh, with people's questions uh, and comments uh, in some detail. Uh, but I'd like to set a context first. Um, what Ireland is involved in right now uh, is one of the uh, most substantial foreign policy challenges that we've faced for decades. Uh, and that is the, the consequences of the decision of our closest neighbour in many ways our closest friend uh, that we have shared a complex history with uh, to leave the European Union. Uh, Britain and Ireland joined the European Union together on the 1st of January 1973, uh, ironically six months after I was born. Um, and since then uh, the effect of uh, both countries being in the European Union to the bilateral relationship between those two countries has been a very powerful and a very positive and strong one. Uh, our civil servants have worked together um, in the same corridors and in the same rooms and around the same tables in Brussels and Strasbourg and elsewhere in the European Union on common endeavour in different areas agreeing to pool sovereignty. Uh, nearly always on the same side of the argument in terms of the future direction of the European Union. The design of a new uh, common market and single market for trade, which has always been uh, what has driven British interest uh, in uh, the European Union project. Uh, and it has helped us uh, in no small degree uh, to find a way forward in the context of the peace process on the island of Ireland and in Northern Ireland in particular, and uh, relations between Ireland and Britain east-west. Uh, and that relationship has also facilitated freer movement and travel between both countries, which since Irish independence has always been strong, but since joint EU membership has been strengthened even further in the context of a growing confidence and independence of mind within Irish policymakers. And so when we joined the European Union, ironically, we were far more dependent on Britain and the British economy than we are today and actually by participating as a member of a union, Irish independence and Irish sovereignty uh, has been reinforced rather than undermined in the context of that union. And so it has been a real force for good for Ireland membership and for our relationship with Britain, which has matured uh, in a way that I think a lot of people on this side uh, of the Atlantic Ocean have welcomed and have assisted and have supported throughout that developing relationship too. As nearly 35 million Americans uh, are of Irish descent and watch what happens on the island of Ireland with a lot of interest uh, and uh, not little influence also uh, at certain crucial times in our history. 
So the reason why this is such a fundamental moment for us is that Britain has chosen to take a different direction. Uh, they have chosen a very fundamental uh, change uh, in their approach towards Europe as a continent and the European Union as a collective of countries that have been working together um, since the early 70s. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the rollout and consequences of that decision we are still trying to figure out together. So Ireland is faced with the reality of something that we had virtually nothing to do with um, uh, but the consequences of uh, will have a significant impact uh, on Ireland's place in the European Union and Ireland's relationship with the UK and indeed will influence commercial and trade opportunities in the context of Ireland and Europe's relationship with the United States as well. And we'll talk about why that is um, you know, over the next little while. Uh, so Britain voted to leave the European Union. Um, the establishment didn't expect that anywhere. Um, and as a result of that, um, certainly within the United Kingdom, in my view, there was simply no detailed preparation for this eventuality. And since then, we have seen a rolling and evolving change in approach in terms of uh, what Brexit, when it is finally uh, when it finally happens and takes place, probably after quite a long transition period, will actually look like. And so this is not like some other political storm that comes and goes. And God knows we all know about political storms coming and going these days. This is a much more fundamental policy challenge than that. What we are actually doing now is forging a permanent new relationship between Britain and the European Union and because of that, a permanent uh, change in the relationship between Britain and Ireland as well. Moving away from the shelter of being in the same European Union uh, with a common rule book, if you like, for so much of the decision making that we've taken on the island of Ireland and east-west cooperation between Ireland and the UK. And just in case anybody underestimates the importance of that relationship, from a trading perspective, it's a 63 billion euro probably $75 billion trading relationship uh, each year. That's a pretty big relationship for 4.5 million people. 10% of our workforce is employed directly related to that current trading relationship. Um, there are, for those of you who know Ireland, it's made up of four provinces. There are more Irish-born people living in Britain than there are Irish people living in Connacht today. Um, so we, are, we have an interwoven relationship with Britain that cannot be simply broken um, on the basis of Britain deciding to, to take a different direction. So how are we approaching it? Uh, and what does it look like at the moment? And where is all this going? Um, in late June, uh, the two negotiating teams um, uh, the European side is called uh, the, the EU task force, led by a guy called Michel Barnier, um, a French former politician and, and diplomat. And the British side is led by David Davis, uh, who's the minister for Brexit, uh, with his team. And what was agreed on the suggestion of the European side is that we would, because this is such a huge challenge, we would try to break it up into two different phases. The first phase would be, to be blunt about it, the divorce issues. So what happens to, to EU citizens living and working in Britain today once Britain leaves? What happens to the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of British people who live outside of Britain uh, in European countries, or EU countries, I should say, once Britain leaves? Does their status change? Do they need permits? Uh, can they bring family members to live with them? If they leave Britain for a certain period of time, can they come back again? The normal movement that we take for granted within the European Union, where there is complete free movement of goods, services, capital and people, which is the very basis of the single market, is all of a sudden now called into question. Um, and so that is, that is the first issue that needs to be resolved, or at least there needs to be significant progress made on that uh, in the first phase before we can open what's called phase two, 
which is what the future relationship actually looks like in terms of trade and transition arrangements to get there and so on. The second issue uh, uh, is what's called the financial settlement issues. Now, unfortunately, within the British media, this, this has been spun almost like it's a, a fine for Britain for leaving. Uh, and so it's been very difficult to manage politically within the UK. But essentially what this is, is the, the EU side saying, look, we manage our budgets on a multi-annual financial framework basis. In other words, there's an EU budget agreed until 2020. Britain has committed a financial contribution towards that budget up until 2020. And so we expect Britain to follow through on that commitment. And the British side is saying, well, hang on a second, we're not paying anything into a union that we're leaving. Or that at least until a few weeks ago was the position uh, of many um, within the UK. And so that's a very fundamental issue because if Britain doesn't contribute financially, well then all of a sudden there is a hole in the EU's budget and other countries will have to pay more into the EU budget to actually pay for Britain leaving uh, in the context of a multi-annual financial framework which is as you can imagine, a pretty sensitive political issue because Britain is a very big financial contributor to EU budgets. And then the third issue uh, in, the, uh, in the first phase of negotiations is Ireland. Um, and so Ireland is in the same category as the financial settlement and citizens' rights. It's a big deal. And that's because within the European Union there is real awareness now of what is at stake for Ireland why we are in such a vulnerable and exposed position in the context of our relationship with Britain and Britain leaving. And actually the focus hasn't even been on trade. Uh, and it's a huge trade relationship as I referred to earlier. The focus for now in the context of the Irish issues are on Northern Ireland, maintaining and supporting a peace process that has taken 30 years to get to where it is now. Um, ensuring that we don't see a return to a border, a physical border on the island of Ireland, uh, which would be hugely detrimental both to the peace process and to the normality that we have grown used to, I'm glad to say in recent years, on the island of Ireland. Uh, because Ireland really has the only physical land border between the European Union and the UK, with the exception of a very narrow bridge leading out to Gibraltar. But, but, you know, it's a 500 kilometer uh, land border with 260 substantial road crossings and many other paths and mountains and farms that span that border too. And those of you who know anything about the Irish peace process will know why that border is so sensitive and so important to the conversation that we're having today. Um, and then, of course, there's the issue of uh, what's called the common travel area for Ireland. Uh, since independence, Ireland and Britain had this arrangement uh, whereby Irish people could move and live and access social welfare and healthcare and education facilities and pensions in the UK and British people in Ireland could do the same. And you could carry your entitlements back and forth between the two countries. It was almost a recognition of citizenship in each other's countries rather than simply free movement. And we are saying in these negotiations, whatever happens here, we need to maintain that common travel area approach because it's been hugely important both for the peace process but also for east-west relations between the two islands as well as the two countries. And I think there is a recognition of that. So the three fundamental Irish issues are protecting the peace process. In particular, how do we implement in full the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement, uh, as the British government will call it, um, uh, in its entirety? That isn't simply some kind of voluntary agreement between two governments. It is a legal treaty uh, that has been submitted to the UN. Uh, uh, and it is something that both governments, as co-guarantors of that agreement, have a responsibility legally to implement. The problem, of course, with the Good Friday Agreement, and it is a, a document of some genius, I have to say, that involved quite a lot of US input, um, but the problem is that much of it assumes that Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are, say, are, are part of the same European Union in terms of a Charter for Fundamental Rights, in terms of animal health and welfare in the context of the common agricultural policy, uh, in environmental rules and regulations, and the list goes on and on and on. And so all of a sudden, if a different rule book applies to Northern Ireland, 
than applies to the rest of the island of Ireland, how do we manage in a seamless way to have cooperation north-south, to manage an all-island economy, to manage an all-island approach towards animal health and disease control, to manage an all-island approach in some areas around environmental management and health care and so on. Uh, that becomes extremely complicated and it effectively will require Northern Ireland to maintain equivalence in terms of regulatory standards with the rest of the island of Ireland in the context of north-south cooperation working as it's meant to in the Good Friday Agreement. So these things are not straightforward. Uh, and that is why it has taken a lot of diplomacy and a lot of travel and a lot of handshakes and a lot of conversations and a lot of dinners and lunches to talk to other European countries about why Ireland is so uniquely exposed here and why the European Union has a responsibility to maintain the momentum in a peace process that it helped to build. And I have to say, the response from other European uh, countries has been hugely positive. And Michel Barnier himself, in particular, is incredibly defensive of Ireland's issues and Ireland's vulnerabilities. And that is why we have the strength of language that we have in the negotiating guidelines for the EU side. And that is why we have so far also got from the British government pretty strong language in all of these areas too, in a positive sense. The problem is that language is aspirational. What we don't have is the roadmap to achieve those aspirations. So the British government says there can be no physical border, on the, sorry, physical infrastructure uh, on the Irish border. Uh, we want to protect and maintain the Good Friday Agreement in all of its facets. We recognise that we have a responsibility to the whole of Ireland, north and south. Um, this is the kind of language that we are getting. We want to maintain the common travel area in full as it operates today after Brexit. Um, so we are uh, getting the recognition that we are asking for aspirationally from what the British Prime Minister is saying in her speeches and that is very welcome. But the real challenge is how do we translate that into a new legal and constitutional and economic and political reality between Britain and the European Union after Brexit. Because the current position still is maintained, although many are questioning it, that actually Britain is leaving the European Union, we're leaving the customs union, we're leaving the single market, we're closing the door, and then we would like to negotiate the opening of that door again on, you know, on negotiated terms. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that if at the end of this, um, Britain, and Ireland and the European Union are not operating within the same customs union, however you design that, then how legally do you avoid customs checks somewhere on the island of Ireland between north and south, or between east and west? How is that done? And if it's not done, you are undermining the integrity of the single market within the European Union, which every country in, in the European Union will be adamant in defending. Because we have spent many years building up integrity and common standards and a common approach towards everything from state aid rules to competition to environmental law uh, and standards and so on, right across a single market with half a billion people. So we can't create some kind of backdoor into that by cutting some kind of grey deal with the UK. Uh, that is not saleable to the other EU countries that are part of this process. So what they're saying is we accept that there is a need for unique and imaginative solutions is the terminology that's used to solve the unique Irish problems. But in doing so, we must not undermine the integrity of the single market. Uh, and so the ball is very much back in the British court here. Because what has been promised to many people in Britain that it is possible to leave the European Union while holding on to all of the benefits of membership and actually gaining new benefits from being outside of the European Union. And we can do all of that at the same time and it will lead to some kind of glorious new future for Britain and the world. That is not going to happen. And it's very clear now that that can't happen because the EU cannot effectively reward a country for leaving the European Union by continuing to apply all of the benefits of EU membership and ignoring all of the other things that that country wants to do with, with other third countries in terms of um, uh, trade agreements and so on. And I think there is an understanding and a realisation that's growing in Britain that that is now the case. And so there are difficult choices to be made. 
Um, and so, uh, from our perspective, um, the way this uh, works from week to week is that the agreement is that we will need to get substantial progress made on phase one issues, citizens' rights, financial settlement, and the Irish issues, before heads of state who will meet in two weeks' time uh, will give the green light to moving on to phase two of the negotiations, which is the transition arrangements and the new realities after transition in terms of trading arrangements and political agreements and so on. We want to move on to phase two in Ireland. Our trading relationship with Britain east-west is hugely important to us. But we need to make sure that we get some clarity and we don't simply avoid the difficult political choices on the phase one issues before we get there. And Ireland needs to use the leverage that we do have in each phase to make sure that we look after Irish citizens and Irish interests uh, as a consequence of a decision in the UK that I said earlier uh, we had nothing to do with in the first place, but we have to deal with the consequences of. Um, so uh, I think it is unlikely uh, that there will be sufficient progress on the three issues uh, to allow for uh, phase two discussions to open, uh, but let's see. Uh, it will certainly require more movement on the British government side. Negotiations start again next Monday on the 8th. Uh, and then once we move on to phase two, we will have both phases then being negotiated in parallel with each other. And of course, many of the border issues, for example, in Ireland will be linked potentially to any new trading understanding or arrangement that we have uh, in the future. Uh, and so we can't solve all of the phase one issues in their own right and then start on phase two, there is a need to progress both in, in parallel, but there's also a need to make sufficient progress in terms of understanding on phase one before uh, the phase two discussion begins. So this is a difficult negotiation. Um, we are on the EU side, even though we are on the opposite side of the table from a good friend. Um, what I would say to Britain, and I, and I say it all the time, is that Ireland is probably the closest friend you have here in these negotiations. And, and that's true. Like, the outcome we want, I think, is very close to the outcome that Britain wants, which is a close trading relationship with the European Union that is seamless, that is barrier-free, if possible, uh, that is a good political relationship, too, um, uh, but recognises the fact that the British people voted to politically leave the European Union. Um, I don't believe that British people, and I don't believe even English people, uh, voted uh, to leave the customs union and the single market in the way that has been interpreted since. I just don't believe that, um, uh, because I don't think it, it's in Britain's interests um, uh, for that to be the case. So how does this apply to, the, to, to Ireland's relationship with the US? Um, and this is something that isn't being spoken of, uh, of enough. Uh, in my view. Much of the, um, first of all, Ireland's relationship with the US uh, is a hundred billion dollar trade relationship every year. So for a little country of four million people, it's a huge trading relationship. Uh, and it's a more or less even when you take goods and services together. Um, neither country really has a surplus or deficit. There's a slight surplus on the US side, but it's, it's not, not major. Um, there's about 100,000 jobs in the US economy in every state um, uh, employed through Irish companies. Now there's about 150,000 in Ireland employed by US companies. Uh, and so the, the, the interrelationship between the Irish and US economy is a very, very strong one. And many US companies use Ireland as a platform to sell into the single market. Um, I think that in the future, uh, this concept of Ireland being a bridge between these two huge economies, the US on one side and the single market within the European Union on the other side, uh, is going to become even stronger in the future in the context of Britain leaving and the uncertainty that comes from that. Uh, uh, and I believe that the, the trade relationship, uh, future discussions around a transatlantic trade arrangement which are on ice for the moment, which, which, but which undoubtedly at some point in the future will be discussed again, uh, puts Ireland in a very interesting strategic position as a partner for the United States as well as a member of the European Union. And I think that from a policy point of view and from a commercial opportunity point of view, uh, the, the opportunities are very, very significant there. Um, if you look at the success of Britain and the United Kingdom attracting foreign direct investment 
uh, as an EU member state, it has been the most successful. Uh, and if you look at the numbers around that, my understanding is that 50% of the decisions to, to invest in, in Britain uh, as a foreign direct investment proposition has been to target consumers in the British economy. The other 50% of that investment has been to use Britain as a platform to trade into the rest uh, of the European Union and indeed to other parts of the world. That 50% um, in the future uh, may well be up for grabs. Nobody is going to sell into Britain if they have to pay further tariffs to sell into the rest of the European Union. And there are very substantial US companies at the moment that are looking at rejigging and changing their entire uh, routes to market because of that. Uh, and again, that uh, um, delivers very exciting and interesting opportunities from an Irish perspective in terms of future cooperation um, with the US, which is one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, so, uh, so look, this is, a, apart from anything else, a bit like our relationship with Britain, Ireland's relationship with the US goes way beyond commercial opportunities. It's families, it's politics, it's history, uh, it's tragedy, um, it's generational, and it's powerful, uh, and it will remain so. And we will disagree on things at times. The European Union will disagree with the US and we'll be part of the European arguments in many cases. Um, but sometimes I think we offer an interesting perspective given how well we know and how integrated we are uh, with, uh, with US thinking um, politically. Uh, and again, I think uh, the relationship, which is stronger than I think than it's ever been, uh, will be tested in the future in a positive way uh, as the new opportunities potentially from Brexit emerge. But unfortunately, uh, the damage limitation that we're currently focusing on, because there are very, very few upsides, in my view, uh, from Brexit, the damage limitation that we're currently uh, uh, focus on, uh, focusing on will remain our focus um, for the foreseeable future, certainly for the next 18 months or so, until we move into what I hope will be quite a long transition phase, which will allow further evolution of British thinking on Brexit so that we can come to a much more sensible outcome um, as opposed to the kind of hard Brexit thinking that unfortunately some people still advocate for. Um, so with that, I look forward to your questions and thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Mr. Minister, thank you so much. Uh, great remarks and incredibly rich content. Uh, let me just, I'm going to start off with the Brexit, but then I, I want to move a little bit more fully to Northern Ireland. I want to uh, spend a little time there. Your comments that, you know, in some ways, the United Kingdom and Ireland uh, were in together January 1st of 1973. You're not coming out together. Do you get the sense that after the UK leaves the European Union that Ireland will be a bit more isolated in its view, its economic view. You had similarities, that energy, yeah. uh, that, that dynamism. You're certainly seeing at least some benefit. Uh, companies are, are now uh, coming to Dublin, whether it's financial services. Uh, is there some benefit to this? And, and are you concerned about some post-Brexit isolation in, in economic perspective? Yeah. Well, I mean, undoubtedly, I think Britain leaving the European Union is a huge loss for the European Union uh, in policy terms. Um, Ireland and Britain, I think, would have a very similar view of the world in the context of uh, free trade, globalization, um, collective responsibilities uh, in many areas from, from security to climate change and so on. Um, so I often found myself arguing with a British minister to try to convince other countries of our point of view. Um, we're going to lose that partnership now. Um, and we're going to have to work hard to find time and reasons for British ministers to meet each other to make sure that we have the kind of relationships that we have today. Uh, because sometimes an absence of engagement leads to people drifting apart somewhat. And I think that is a danger. Um, there are some opportunities, undoubtedly. You know, we're seeing uh, many companies, uh, particularly financial services at the moment, but I think there will be others as well uh, in terms of pharma, biopharma. I mean, any industry or company that relies on um, a regulatory environment that is predictable uh, is going to be concerned about their current operations in Britain because there is no predictability about what the future holds right now. 
Um, I hope that will change soon. Um, as I said, this is not a pitch by me to try and encourage businesses from Britain to Ireland. I mean, our long-term interest here is in a strong, growing British economy that we help to feed and support with services and um, you know, uh, food industries and technology and so on. Um, so, um, so, I mean, I see a lot more downside to Brexit than upside, in particular for Britain. Um, and if there were to be a hard Brexit, in other words, if negotiations were to collapse, uh, and instead of a negotiated outcome from March 2019 on, WTO rules were to simply kick in, which is what would happen in the absence of agreement, uh, that would be um, uh, a very, very serious and negative uh, situation, both for the British economy but also for the Irish economy. I mean, you're talking about tariffs of nearly 60% on products like beef. And we sell 2 billion euros worth of beef to Britain every year. Um, you're talking about tariffs of over 40% on dairy product. 40% of Northern Ireland's milk produced on, milk, uh, on dairy farms in Northern Ireland is processed south of the border. Um, so you're talking about paralyzing the, the border economies um, in the context of a border that has to facilitate trade under WTO rules. Now, I don't think that's likely to happen, and that is the sort of calamity worst case scenario, but that is a consequence of there being no deal, just to be clear. Um, and we need to make sure that that doesn't happen, and Ireland is literally working night and day to make sure it doesn't happen. My responsibility in government, as well as being a foreign minister and trade minister, uh, is that I am responsible for coordinating the government's collective response on Brexit. Uh, sometimes I need to say things that maybe the British government don't like to hear, uh, but I see myself playing, needing to play the role of a sort of a candid friend here, uh, to try to help reorientate the debate uh, into a place uh, that, is, um, um, that is more real in terms of what's possible. Um, but that's a very difficult thing, and I, I, I do understand the British government's dilemma here. You know, what's been promised a year ago is very different to what's possible to deliver now. Uh, and how does a minority government uh, uh, facilitate a change in public opinion to accept uh, a change in negotiating strategy towards an outcome that is a little bit different to what was sold, in fact, very different, perhaps, to what was sold a few months ago. But, um, but we are, I mean, the language is changing, and that's good. You know, there was many people in the British government saying there would be no transition period. Now they're talking about at least two years. They're now saying to businesses, look, you'll only have to change once. We're not going to ask you to change for a transition period, too. Um, uh, the language of um, we will demand a, uh, a, a, uh, a free trade deal is now we want to negotiate a, a trade partnership. Uh, the language of we are not going to be in the customs union uh, is now balanced, I think, somewhat by, by talk of trying to design a new customs partnership that would avoid the need for customs checks. Um, so, you know, um, there, there is some reason to be uh, somewhat optimistic in terms of moving in the right direction, but I still think there's quite a long way to go before we're in a place where there's um, a basis for agreement, I have to say. I think just pulling one comment, I think the one element of unpredictability has just been injected with today's announcement that the Commission is referring Ireland to the European Court of Justice on the 13 billion euro tax bill to Apple. And I think questions about Ireland's uh, economic and its corporate tax structure, that's certainly giving some U.S. companies well, some pause. I'm not sure, actually, because U.S. companies that actually know how Ireland operates wouldn't have too many concerns about this. Um, first of all, the Apple ruling that we got some time ago from the Commission, we fundamentally disagree with, as do Apple. Uh, and we are going to go to court to, uh, to get a clarity on, on those issues. Uh, what had been agreed at that point with the Commission was that Ireland would collect the 13 billion euros from Apple, and Apple has agreed to pay it, and that we would put it in a suspense account, and then wait for the, for the, for the court proceedings to conclude, and then depending on what the court says, we will either give the money back to Apple or it'll go elsewhere. Right? Uh, and so what the commission has done today is simply said, we're not happy, is simply they have said, we're not happy that you have collected the 13 billion euros and, and put it in a suspense account as was agreed and that that's not happening fast enough. 
So there isn't a, we're not uh, being referred to the ECJ because we're, we're not collecting money and spending it. Um, this is simply a procedural issue of collecting money and putting in a suspense account as was agreed. Uh, and we actually are doing that. Um, but it's quite a complicated thing actually to find somewhere to put 13 billion euros. <laughs> um, I have some ideas. It's, it's, it's not, uh, and not spend it. Uh, uh, um, and put it in a suspense account where it's safe. Um, actually, that's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, and we are putting the arrangements in place to do that. Um, and I think that, um, that when the European Commission sees the detail of that, I don't think this ECJ uh, referral will, will really go anywhere. Um, the real issue is, of course, what happens in terms of the, the, uh, the court hearing and the appeal of that. Um, and of course, you know, what happens in the future in terms of Apple's relationship with the, with the US side when they repatriate very significant profits that they would have had. Um, because I mean, Apple would of course contend that they are going to pay a very large tax bill when they do that. Uh, and therefore they have put money aside for that purpose. Uh, and so they haven't been avoiding tax at all. So let's, let, let's wait and see how that plays out in the court. But just like on the general, I sometimes hear loose talk um, this side of the Atlantic on, on Ireland's approach towards corporate, corporate tax. Um, I mean, we, we have a low corporate tax rate. Uh, it's competitive, but it's, it's by no means way out there or anything like that. I mean, if you compare Ireland to other countries in the OECD, uh, there are 12 countries that have a lower corporate tax rate than Ireland. And there are 21 countries that have a higher corporate tax rate than Ireland. So we're kind of in the bottom, th at the top of the bottom third. Um, but we're not sort of way out there on a limb or anything like that. Um, but Ireland unapologetically sets a low corporate tax rate, but is very transparent about how we, how we implement it. Unlike lots of other countries, by the way, who, have, uh, who sell a, a higher corporate tax rate, but actually through various different mechanisms mean that in effect a lot of big corporations pay far, far less than that, uh, which in general isn't the case in Ireland. Um, so, um, so, you know, we, it's part of our proposition. Uh, we have a very strong proposition in terms of education, uh, English speaking, outward looking, hard working people also, which I think is very much part of the reason why when a lot of US companies move to Ireland, they stay and grow there. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, the package goes way beyond taxation. One last question before I turn to our audience. I want to just touch on Northern Ireland yeah. and particularly, again, how Brexit will impact that. You have the leader of Sinn Féin, Michelle O'Neill, calling for Northern Ireland after Brexit to be either a special economic zone or receive special EU status. You have Arlene Foster uh, leads the DUP saying, nope, Northern Ireland's going to leave with the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, there were some, some words exchanged. There's not been a power sharing executive in Northern Ireland since January. A yeah. clock is also ticking in addition to Brexit to have that power sharing uh, government formed hopefully by the end of this month. So we don't see Westminster having to, to take over that. Uh, help us understand what's at stake in Northern yeah. Ireland. And is there a role for the U.S.? Uh, is, there, is there a mediation role that yeah. we should be playing? Yeah. Um, uh, part of my responsibilities uh, are Northern Ireland too. Um, so I've spent quite a lot of time in Belfast in, in the last few months um, trying to help uh, the two largest parties in Northern Ireland find accommodation of each other. Um, I think anybody who takes the peace process in Northern Ireland for granted doesn't really understand it. Um, and particularly looking from afar, you'd be forgiven. You know, the, the Good Friday Agreement was put in place 20 years ago, or 20 years ago next year. Um, and it's true, by and large, people have stopped killing each other, which is, it's been an, a fantastic success. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's done. Uh, there's still real divisions in Northern Ireland between communities. People still live apart. Um, there's still some walls and some wires that we would rather not see. Uh, but we are in immeasurably a better place than we were 20 years ago. Um, but that doesn't mean that the politics is, is any less divisive today. Uh, and part of the reason why it's so difficult to get the Vile government back up and running is that it collapsed in the earlier part of this year in a very acrimonious and difficult way. And what that did is it triggered an election uh, for the Assembly, which is elections in Northern Ireland, which was a very bitter election. And straight after that, then, the British Prime Minister called another election. So, so we've had um, 
generally elections in Northern Ireland um, drive people into their corners as opposed to encourage uh, a sense of, of reaching out or compromise. And so to have two elections, one after the other, when they were both very difficult and very divisive elections in terms of both the personality uh, politics of those elections, because there's new leadership in both, the, in both Sinn Féin and the DUP, and of course on the sort of constitutional issues also, um, has meant that the environment at the start of the summer was, very, was a very, very difficult one for both parties and their support base to find the ability and space to be able to compromise in a way that could be the basis for setting up a, a new executive. So we've been working with them on that. Um, this is also a two-phase process. But like, I'm sorry if I bored you on the phases earlier. <laughs> a lot of phases. Uh, We're phasing. Uh, um, but we need to get Sinn Féin and the DUP, yes. first of all, because they're the two large parties. Without either of them, there can't be an executive in Northern Ireland. They both need to be in. So that's the first thing. And if we can get them to agree a basis for forming a government, then the other parties in Northern Ireland, the SDLP, the Ulster Unionist Party, and the Alliance, uh, have said that they will then join the discussions very quickly uh, and look to put their fingerprints on, on any program for government that would be agreed as well. Um, and so we are in that process of trying to finish the first phase at the moment. Uh, it's very much a bilateral discussion between the two parties. Um, I think they are really trying. Uh, to find a way forward here, but there are some very, very sensitive issues that they're dealing with, um, that there's very strident views on uh, within the communities that they represent. Uh, and, um, but this can't go on forever. You know, like you cannot, a country cannot be run by the civil service forever without there being a big problem. Um, and uh, so at some point, there will be a need either to start making decisions for Northern Ireland and Westminster with the input of Dublin, because under the Good Friday Agreement, we have a, an obligation under North-South cooperation and under some East-West uh, structures and cooperation to have an input there too. But I mean, it would be a disastrous situation for day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week decisions for Northern Ireland to be made outside of Northern Ireland. You can imagine how isolated many communities would feel in that context. And the very functioning of the Good Friday Agreement itself would be dramatically undermined uh, because the, at the core of it, is Northern Ireland's ability to be able to make decisions for itself. Um, so we have to prevent that from happening, and we are working very hard, and I suspect I'll be back in Belfast on Friday uh, to try to help the parties get to where we need to be to trigger a new, a new piece of legislation in, in Westminster that can set up the Assembly and uh, devolve government again. So that was a long answer, but I think it's an important answer because I know that there are many people in the audience here who, who actually understand Northern Ireland very well, um, uh, and that is... Um, that is what's happening at the moment. Um, you did ask me one or two other questions. Well, that's all uh, right. We'll catch them. I want to get we'll our audience in, and I know our time is uh, very brief. So if you could please raise your hand. Uh, if you have a question for the minister, please identify yourself and keep your question very brief. We're going to take a couple of questions, and then the minister uh, will, will give us a concluding remark. And then I know you are off to the White House for a meeting, so we will be very uh, efficient with our questions. So let me begin. Uh, Max in the back, and we'll just work our way forward. Yes, please. Right there is fine. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Austin. I'm a master's student at the Elliott School. Um, you briefly mentioned DUP earlier, and as we know, since the British election, they agreed to support Theresa May's government in conditions that I think the, the term was cases of like mutual interest. Of course, Brexit in Ireland, nothing's in Northern Ireland, nothing is more Northern Ireland self-interest. So I was wondering if you could come, if you could say something about how, if your government is um, has been more optimistic about. Brexit being on favorable terms to Ireland in light of DUP's expanded role in Westminster, or if that really hasn't affected your calculus at all. Thank you. Thank you. And Good we'll question. just move up to the front mic right there. Thank you. Uh, Mike Masetic, uh, you described the British government as a minority government. Isn't that fairly charitable? that it's really a divided government, particularly if you've been listening to the Tory party conference this week, listening to Boris Johnson. Uh, the rolling back of even some of the statements by other cabinet ministers, rolling back what May said in Florence. I mean, is this a government prepared to go ahead and negotiate something as complex as the departure from the EU? Thank you. We'll have that qu question over there, please. Hello, Minister. I'm Peter Kissel from the Irish American Unity Conference. Uh, a question regarding phase one and phase two negotiations with the EU. 
Um, there are several commentators, not a lot, but there are several commentators, and I believe Ray Bassett is one who contend that the issue over Ireland's border cannot be resolved independently and prior to the long-term trade relationship between the EEO and Britain. Uh, I wondered if you could offer your thoughts on, on, uh, on that. And I want to take one more question just on this side, and I'm so sorry, I know there's so many hands up, but I need to give the minister time to respond, and you only have about five minutes to respond, and these are big uh, questions. Uh, so. Thank you, uh, Brett Fortin with Inside US Trade. Um, we know that the, the Commerce Department is currently considering um, AD and CBD duties against Bombardier um, in, in a trade remedy case. Uh, I was wondering, it, have you cautioned the U.S. government at all um, on some of the potential impacts? And if the Commerce Department does decide to move forward with that, do you expect there to be any spillover effect in terms of the future transatlantic relationship between um, the U.S. Uh, and, and the EU and the U.S. and the U.K.? Minister, I'm going to let you handle those for because I fear yeah. we're not going to have much Sorry, more time to take. Sorry, my apologies if, if Well, you, we have to have you back. That's, okay. that's just Great. what we'll do. <laughs> um, first of all, on the DUP question, um, I mean, I have mixed views on this. Um, I believe the DUP wants an outcome here that's good for Northern Ireland. And what's good for Northern Ireland is as close to the status quo as possible. I don't believe the DUP want to have a hard border. In fact, I know they don't. Um, uh, and so, in fact, they want to maintain more or less the arrangements that are there right now, if it's possible to do that. Uh, and the DUP will need to vote for the Brexit legislation that's introduced by the British government for it to pass. And so uh, I suspect they, w they have the potential to use their influence uh, to, to try to move towards sensible solutions in Northern Ireland um, uh, in a way that, that could actually be quite impactful if they chose to use it. Um, but I think there are probably different views within the DUP as well in terms of whether they should or shouldn't be, uh, be in that territory. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Um, I mean, clearly they have a different perspective from Sinn Féin, who are saying they want Northern Ireland to remain part of the European Union in, in a spe special status arrangement. I don't think that's a realistic possibility, to be honest. Uh, what we want is something in between, whereby First of all, the, the preference would be for all of Britain, including Northern Ireland, to remain in the same customs union that's been redesigned to, to accommodate Britain so that we don't need uh, customs checks on the border or in ports east-west uh, between Britain and Ireland. Um, but in the absence of that being possible, well, then there's going to be a need to, to try to design something uniquely for Northern Ireland. Uh, recognizing the, the challenges that we face with the border, undoubtedly. And that's where it gets really tricky. Because if, if you design, design something uniquely for Northern Ireland, well then unionists in Northern Ireland feel that that is creating separation between Northern Ireland and mainland Britain, moving towards um, you know, a closer relationship with the Republic of Ireland, which is leading into an agenda that they're very uncomfortable with. Um, so that complicates the thing even further, uh, as if it wasn't complicated enough as it was. Um, in terms of uh, the British government being divided, look, you know, it's, it, it's probably not helpful for me to talk about the British government being, being divided. I mean, I think there is an ongoing debate within the Conservative Party in Britain that's been going on for many, many years in terms of having a very different view on Britain's relationship with Europe and the European Union. And that continues today. The problem is the consequence of that debate is a much more dramatic one now than it was in the past. Uh, and that is why, you know, and I keep saying it, we are trying to get clarity from the British government in terms of where this is all going. Uh, and it's obviously up to the leadership to try to provide that. And I think Theresa May, particularly in her Florence speech, was trying to do that. And I think she deserves some credit for that. Um, uh, she certainly went, I think, probably as far as she could politically at that point. Um, but look, you know, there are others in the, in the Conservative Party that, um, that have their say too. And on both sides of that argument, by the way, um, uh, in, in terms of softer and harder. Um, Ray, Ray Bassett's comments, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've heard Ray Bassett make the case that Ireland should be leaving with Britain. I, I, I think that was the case he was making anyway. Uh, um, I absolutely disagree with that view, and I think the vast, vast majority of Irish people do too. 
Um, Ireland actually, and it, it's been polled in recent months, 90% of Irish people want Ireland to remain as a member of the European Union. I think that is the highest of any country in the European Union and the highest in any country in the European Union by a considerable margin. Um, so Irish people see the benefits of the single market. They have seen the benefits over the last 30 years of, of membership and, and beyond, actually, 45 years now, uh, of, of EU membership, and they want more of that. And they want the stability that comes with that and the, uh, the voice that Ireland has internationally through those, those institutions and so on. And we regret, we deeply regret, the choice that Britain has taken, but we're not going to join them on it. Um, there is zero chance of that, in my view. Um, and that is not the solution to solving the border problems, I can tell you. Um, I mean, just to put it into context, 17% of Irish exports go to the UK now. Over 40% go to the rest of the European Union. So we wouldn't be cutting off that, um, that opportunity lightly. Uh, on Bombardier, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I had a, a good and frank discussion with um, um, Secretary uh, uh, Wilbur Ross this morning. Um, and I thank him for that meeting. Uh, I don't want to go into the detail of the discussion uh, because this is a very sensitive issue. Uh, but just my role, I think, was to, to reinforce the point um, that uh, the potential fallout or consequence of, uh, of this, this case and, and the initial judgment, our draft judgment, uh, for Northern Ireland may well be very significant. Uh, you know, if it's not managed properly. There are 4,000 people employed by Bombardier in Belfast. They are, by some margin, the largest private sector employer in Northern Ireland. Wow. Uh, it's in East Belfast, um, uh, and it's a, very, in, it's, it's, it's a hugely important part of Northern Ireland's economy. In fact, I think, and I would stand corrected on this, but I think Bombardier's exports out of Northern Ireland represent 10% of Northern Ireland's exports. Wow. So that's how significant this is. Wow. Uh, and so I know how important Northern Ireland and the peace process in Northern Ireland is to um, uh, consecutive US administrations, including this one. Uh, and so I felt it was important that an Irish government would raise this issue in the context of a peace process which is being reinforced by economic opportunity yes. uh, all of the time and that this could be a very significant setback if it's not managed properly. And I think he got that. Um, to be fair, I think his options are somewhat limited in terms of what he can do here. Um, but I think it was a conversation that needed to be had all the same. And, um, and we did speak about it for some time this morning. Mr. Minister, thank you. This has been an incredible tour de force of some of the most critical issues. We're following this closely. We thank you for your insights. One thing before we thank the minister, um, we'd like everyone to remain seated. The minister and his delegation need to move very quickly to their next meeting. And then as soon as we out the door, uh, we wish everyone a, a great day. But please, before we do that, please thank the minister and uh, for his time. Thank you. Thank you.